Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Israel and Gaza and about Germany and Namibia. Our guest, Henning Melber, is speaking with us from Uppsala, Sweden. He has written an article called Namibia, Germany and Israel, the pitfalls of selective remorse and trauma. He is with the Nordic Africa Institute and is a senior advisor and Director Emeritus of the Doc Hammarskjöld Foundation. Henning Melber, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, briefly, what is the Nordic Africa Institute? The Nordic Africa Institute, as the name suggests, is a public institution, actually a Swedish public institution, established in 1962 at a time when Sweden was beginning to leave a mark punching above its weight in international policies by pursuing a value-based foreign policy, human rights oriented in support of anti-colonial struggles. And the Nordic Africa Institute, which is also supported by other Nordic countries, Finland, and uh, Norway and Denmark was a member of it, uh, which has opted out. Iceland is in support of the Nordic Africa Institute. That institute has a history reflecting such value-based approach. It does autonomous research while it is a public institution. It sets its own agenda, but with a focus on policy advice. So it is providing valuable solid research, but with the intention to share it with policymakers. If they make use of it, that's up for them. But this is basically the institutional integrity of the Institute, and it so far has been widely respected on the African continent for being what it is. Sounds excellent. And the Doc Hammarskjöld Foundation, can you tell us a little about that and for whom it's named? The Hammarskjöld Foundation, as the name suggests, bears the name of the second Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Hammarskjöld. He was killed as the only Secretary General in executing his duties in office in 1961, when he was on his way to Ndola, a mining town in then northern Rhodesia, to meet the leader of the secessionist Katanga province to find a solution for the civil strife in the Congo, which had just a couple of months before become independent. Until the very day, the causes of the crash of the plane when approaching Dola is contested and a renewed matter of investigation in the United Nations, which actually, just as a sideline remark, would merit another conversation the current investigations into the death, or may I say, the killing of Dark Hammarskjöld and all 15 others on board of that plane when trying to seek a solution which was not very much at the pleasure of the Western states. Maybe also not of, uh, of the Soviet Union, but there are sufficient uh, indications and a worrying amount of evidence that this plane crashed not as an accident, but by external force. And currently the United Nations are reinvestigating the circumstances of that plane crash, which is also noticeable as a, a development. Coming back to the foundation, sorry, I had to, I had to add that background. I, I hope we can have you back on that topic. The foundation was established uh, to honor the legacy of Dark Hammarskjöld in the same year like the Nordic Africa Institute, 1962, again highlighting the turning point also in Swedish value-based foreign policy. And it promotes mainly United Nations related, again, policy advice, less so research, more policy advice, when it comes to a value-based United Nations policy, which in our days is of course very much in need as we know 
the UN Charter, all the United Nations conventions, they are violated left, right, and center from basically almost every member state you can imagine, depending on what focus you, you put on or what hat are you wearing. But we are in times where a value-based international policy is ignored by most countries. And again, that underlines the need for institutions which pursue some degree of integrity. And this is what Doc Hammarskjöld personified. You do not com compromise on fundamental principles relating to human rights. Well, I don't want to praise any government very much, but we do know that there's one that often has to veto the rest of the whole darn world and that the United Nations would have taken some steps on the genocide underway in Gaza were it not for the veto of the government uh, whose nation I am in at the moment, the United States. Uh, and so it came to South Africa's government to prosecute the crime of genocide to take that to the International Court of Justice uh, against Israel. And what has what has Germany done uh, about that? Well, we are in a really weird situation. And I would say weird is a very mild description of the situation. Um, it borders to a perversion of all fundamental values that underline the idea and the foundation of the United Nations as a so-called family of nations. What we witness is that the current Secretary General of the United Nations is actually sticking his neck out very widely in the tradition of a dark Hammarskjöld by making points which are constantly ignored by basically the main hegemonic powers who execute a veto right in the Security Council, which points to another structural problem. United Nations system needs a urgent reform. We are living in a world where basically you cannot pursue and implement the normative fundamental values of the UN Charter any longer because those states executing a veto power are dismissing the fundamental principles they have signed up by ratifying as member states the very charter. And the last example, not the first, the last in a series of examples, is the current situation when it comes to the aggression of Israel on the Gaza population, which includes deliberate forms of elimination of a vast amount of the civilian population and the maiming of many more of them, destroying the futures of children for at least a generation. And that's another perversity. By doing that, are not as they declare as an intention, eliminate Hamas, they actually foster a new generation of people confronted with that extermination strategy, if they should survive as traumatized children, to be the potential for new recruitment of similar organizations like Hamas. So it's, I consider it as an organized madness what we are witnessing. And not enough, you refer to your own country, and I know what nickname uh, your president currently has among those who are critical, uh, which I think he never expected. And if you, for example, listened to a speech by an Irish member of the European Parliament yesterday, then uh, you would say that's it, because she said, not in our name and never ever refer to your Irish roots any longer. Ireland is not with you on that. Very interesting because Ireland- I mean, you can say the name Genocide Joe, and you can say the name Claire Daly, who deserves a great deal of, of credit for calling out Genocide Joe. Absolutely. And it's an interesting reminder that countries like Ireland and South Africa, which comes into the picture, share a similar history. And based on that traumatic history, 
they take a different stance to conflicts of that nature. So you need to understand what apartheid meant in South Africa, which only formally ended in 1994, 30 years ago, where they were confronted with a regime which couldn't care less about human rights, institutionalized structural racial discrimination. And that explains why from the beginning and even before there was a very close bond of solidarity with other people in the world exposed to a similar treatment, including the Palestine people. And the same experiences to certain states in the world. The USA, West Germany, before it became United Germany, were strong supporters of the South African apartheid regime, including the delivery of weapons, which that's another perversity. As we just learned yesterday, the German government has decided to do again in the case of Israel. It was announced yesterday that the German government is willing to supply the Israeli army with uh, ammunition for tanks. Under the current circumstances, where there is an ICJ ruling pending, which was triggered by South Africa. So let me come back. Given that shared industry, uh, uh, that shared history of countries like Ireland, South Africa, also Namibia, it comes as no surprise that they are not closing their eyes and ears when it comes to the treatment of the people of Palestine. And in the current circumstances, South Africa submitted a claim in the ICJ, which is difficult in legal terms uh, to get a positive ruling because a claim of genocide, as recent cases have shown, also in the International Criminal Court, are almost impossible to get through based on the evidence. Because like in the current case, it's much easier to prove crimes against humanity and war crimes. There is sufficient evidence that this happens. It's much more difficult in the absence of a clear command line that the IDF in Gaza operates on top instructions, not on based on statements, top instructions by the current Israeli government to execute a genocide. That's the tricky legal question. But I think the intention of South Africa was to obtain a interim ruling of the ICJ to hold the current war strategy that Israel executes which is in line with many other demands for, a, for, a, for a stopping the war crimes and stopping uh, the current strategy of Israel. That would be a relative success because the final uh, judgment, if it is a genocide based on previous experiences might take years for the court to rule. But if they would now make an interim ruling that Israel has to stop its warfare would not mean that Israel would comply. As we know, they couldn't care less what the world is saying, as long at least as they have the backing of certain countries we mentioned already. And But it would increase the moral pressure and it would also increase the pressure in terms of international law because the ICJ is one of the most important institutionalized bodies in global politics. And it would put pressure on other governments as well that are assisting Israel politically, financially, and militarily. And other countries are taking sides publicly and formally and informally on the side of Israel and on the side of South Africa's case against Israel. So what has, what has Germany done and what has been the response from Namibia? Well, Germany made a very 
unfortunate move to put it extremely mildly. I'm trying to be measured at times, even if I don't manage all the time. A very unfortunate move, a totally misguided loyalty to the current right-wing reactionary Israel government in the equation that misleading equation that the Israel government is the Jewish people. And the German government, and unfortunately, a rather large part of the German population is living in this traumatic belief that everything which is critical of the state of Israel, and again translated in the wrong equation, the government of the state of Israel would be anti-Semitic. To the extent that the numerous Jewish in Israel, in the diaspora, like in the US, like in Germany, who are critical of what is going on under this government and have been critical before over the apartheid policy of Israel, are by Germans labeled as anti-Semitic or self-hating Jews. Now, hold for a moment the absurdity of in which we are in. Germans take the arrogance to accuse critical Jews because of their political value-based opinion to name them anti-Semitic and self-hating Jews. The never again as a slogan is perverted in joining the sides with the Israeli extermination strategy of civilians in Gaza. And on 12th of January, South Africa, while the ICJ was still listening to the Israeli position in The Hague, openly declared that they will join Israel as a supporting partner in dismissing the claims brought before the court by South Africa. This is where Namibia comes into the picture. The 12th of January marks 120 years of the beginning of what Namibians call the Namibian-German War, which culminated between 1904 and 1906 in the first genocide of the 20th century. Keep in mind, Germany did not commit one genocide. They committed two genocides during the 20th century, and they were complicit of a third gen genocide committed against the Armenian people on the side of the Osman Empire. And there have been many other genocides in genocide in the 19th century where I'm sitting, among others. Yes. We are now talking about the German genocides. And of course, that does not mean um, there are other countries or, or other perpetrators which would then be off the hook by saying, look, we are not Germany. It's not a German privilege, so to say, to commit genocides. Uh, it's very much the privilege of any given settler society, even if you, it's not any longer perceived as a settler society, if you ask those who survived as indigenous populations, they have stories to tell. Yes, absolutely, I agree entirely. So, but coming back to the point, on that day when the Germans made that statement, while they had admitted in 2015 that what happened at the beginning of the 20th century was a genocide in today's perspective, which is a very important caveat. They did not mention a single word about this 120th anniversary of a genocide committed towards the indigenous people in Namibia. While they had negotiate, negotiated for the last eight years with the Namibian government, how to come to terms 
with the admission of guilt that a genocide was committed. And mind you, part of the negotiations was how to apologize, meaning how to avoid a legal precedence which would, which would result in a claim for reparations. So it's a qualified apology negotiated since eight years, which in itself is rather humiliating for the Namibian side. With the avoidance of the term reparations in the negotiated agreement, because they do not want to pay reparations. They call it compensations. They call it as a sign of remorse. The Namibian government has been very much under pressure by the local indigenous communities who felt marginalized and not adequately represented in those negotiations. Yeah. Means President Gaingo was already under pressure to legitimize what was expected to be endorsed within these days. Then came this German announcement on the 12th of January. And he just totally lost it. He issued a statement the next day on the 13th, and he did not mince his words. It was anything but diplomatic language. And if the Germans have any degree of sensibility, they should be totally ashamed and totally embarrassed. Well, many and Germans are, right? There are protests in the streets in Germany. There are people in Germany who say enough is enough. Stop supporting genocides. Absolutely. And they are prosecuted by the police. Demonstrations are prohibited. Uh, people are arrested and accused if they use certain slogans, while those who have the pro-Israel demonstrations use similar slogans without being arrested or accused or anything. It's a very interesting case of really clashing fundamental uh, positions in Germany and maybe to an extent which could only take place in Germany in the shadow and legacy of the Holocaust. It's very hard for me to even understand the thinking defending a Jewish democratic state, because if they were talking about an Aryan democratic state, nobody would think it was a possible thing. Nobody would think it made any sense. Uh, and yet they have to defend this incoherent idea of a Jewish democratic state, either by completely ignoring what's happening in Gaza or by believing that if you're associated with one big category of the victims of the Holocaust, then you can do, you have a license to do anything you want, which also doesn't make any sense, does it? No, I mean, it goes further back even. The defense of Israeli democracy does not allow to critically interrogate the degree of democracy which is there. Not least since this ultra reactionary right wing government is in place. So, what is advertised by those who justify the totally uncritical uh, support of the Israeli government is that they continuously stress that's the only democracy in the region. And if you dare to ask what democracy are you talking about, hmm. Semitic. If you use the word apartheid, it doesn't help you that you refer to Human Rights Watch, uh, that you refer to Amnesty International, that you refer to many other highly credible international institutions, including commissions and special envoys of the United Nations, including even state-sponsored uh, think tanks of Germany who come to the same conclusion. If you use that, again, it's only proof that you are anti Semitic. And this problem is not just German, right? Have any European nations said they support the case against the Israeli genocide? I mean, numerous countries from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia have not formally filed papers with the International Court of Justice, but have publicly said, we support South Africa's case. I'm not aware of a single country in government, not people, but government in Europe that has said they're against this genocide. 
I'm not aware of that either, but I know that Norway, for example, by its voting behavior in the United Nations General Assembly, uh, Spain and Portugal, and to some extent even France, seem to be rather reluctant to openly back the Israeli strategy. So at least something is going on, which interesting enough suggests that the EU is not speaking with one voice. Never mind that Norway is not a member of the EU, but and I guess Ireland would also not uh, come out in open support of uh, of the Israeli policy towards Gaza. So there is something interesting going on, which at least indicates in nuances that they are don't thinking alike, and that there are people who get increasingly worried and worried about their own credibility. I think we have moved, not from now, but now in a degree which never existed before, in a fundamental realignment of the states in the world. The West has once and for all lost all its legitimacy and credibility when it comes to respect and recognition of fundamental human rights and normative values. That's not new, it's an old story. They had double standards all the time. Yes. Like any other government had got double standards. So it's not only the West, but the West lecturing the rest of the world and especially the global south on the receiving end, what's right and what's wrong, enough. And that's something which Hage Geingob as Namibian president clearly illustrated with his uh, brutal statement that he said, enough is enough. Don't continue telling us what we are supposed to do. You have no credibility in anything you are preaching. Henning Melber, we have about one minute left. If the International Court of Justice rules that there is a genocide underway or a plausible case for it and it needs to be halted, does respect for international bodies and, and or for the West get restored? If the International Court of Justice says, go ahead, proceed with the slaughter, is there any respect left for the United Nations in the world? I'm afraid if the ICJ would not stop by an interim warning what is going on, the global institutions would lose their credibility. If they rule if on that, and it's not only ignored by Israel, but also by Germany, which then clearly would have egg on their face, like the US, then they are sabotaging the international global system as well. So it's difficult to judge. Let's wait and see and hope for the best. Hope dies last. Indeed. Henning Melber, thank you for everything you are doing. We hope to have you back on soon. Thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.